Hi, this is Darren with the Mississippi State Chemical Laboratory, and today we're going to be doing our Keldahl total nitrogen analysis. So I have out here a lot of the stuff we're going to need for this analysis. I have my six samples over there, uh, and then I have reaction vessels ready and labeled. You might notice that there are eight reaction vessels. That's because we need one for each sample, plus one for a blank and one for a spike. Additionally, I have my 250 milliliter graduated cylinder. I'm going to use this to measure 250 milliliters of each water sample into the vessels. And then I have my Keldahl tablets. These are mostly copper sulfate uh, and I believe potassium sulfate. Uh, but copper sulfate is the active ingredient. And then boiling chips to ensure a smooth boil that is not violent. So. Let's just get started. The first thing you want to do is prep the reaction vessels. And you can measure the, the water samples in and then put the tablets in, but I find that that splashes stuff out. And it's easier to do the tablets and the boiling chips first and then add the water on top. So each, each reaction vessel is going to get four of these tablets. They are measured out so that we don't have to actually weigh them, we just count the tablets and drop them in. So I won't do all of them on camera. Uh, and then a pinch of boiling chips. If you forget the boiling chips, then you're going to get a more violent boil during our reaction phase our digest phase uh, and you may lose some of your sample in the process. So just a pinch, that's all that's necessary. Uh, you don't need to measure out how much, just a little bit. Alright, and with those. Um, and now I will fill these guys, so the ones that I put the uh, Keldahl tablets into. That would be number five over here. One crucial thing about these samples is that they are treated with sulfuric acid. So I'll talk a little bit about it later, but what that's going to do is it's going to trap any ammonia in the solution, but it's not nitric acid because if it were nitric acid, then you would be adding nitrogen to the solution and so you wouldn't be getting uh, an accurate result for your total nitrogen analysis. Anyway, I'm going to just pour this into here. You can see it comes up pretty close to the top, uh, which is why we need those boiling chips to make sure it doesn't boil over. Uh, I'm going to rinse this with the ionized water and then do the rest and then I'll come back when we're ready for the next step. So I've got all of the vessels filled up with the sample water and also the blank has the ionized water in it. Uh, of course I was rinsing my graduated cylinder in between filling. Uh, I have not yet filled up the spike because I want to show you how I do that. So it also takes 250 milliliters of deionized water, but I'm not going to put it all in at once. I'm going to put about half of it in. And then I need to add my spike. So what we use is this ERA complex nutrients QC. And if I were to prepare this how it says in the, uh, the 
papers that come with it, it would come in too high for our analysis. So this this will come in in the teens or maybe even low 20s uh, ppm, but our uh, ammonia probe is only calibrated between 0 0.1 and 10, and so I'm actually going to start with a dilution essentially and only put in 250 microliters or 0 0.25 milliliters of this. So that's going into the reaction vessel. Cap this off. And then I'm going to add the rest of the deionized water. And the reason I do that is to give it some, uh, some action to mix up a little bit. It's probably not necessary because this is about to go boil for four hours, but it makes me feel a little bit better. So those are all ready for the next step. I'm going to move the camera and show you that. So I'm over in front of the acid hood now, uh, and this step is crucially important, and you don't want to forget it. I have forgotten it in the past. If you forget this step, then when we boil this all down, it's going to end up with basically nothing left on the bottom, uh, and we don't want that. So what we're going to be doing is adding more sulfuric acid into this um, sample, and really concentrating it. So we're going to be using concentrated sulfuric acid, 8 milliliters per vessel. I already have the dispenser set to 8 milliliters, so I'm just going to prime it, get the air bubbles out, open up the valve, open up the cap, slowly and gently squirt 8 milliliters in. So, probably can't see on the video, but you can see it starting to react in there. Um, it also feels a little warm to the touch. I'm just going to set that aside for now and do the rest. So we're on the final step of the digest portion of the Keldahl analysis, and that is the actual digest. Uh, I have my reaction vessels all ready, and they're filled with 250 milliliters of sample or deionized water, four Keldahl tablets, a pinch of baking, um, or sorry, boiling chips, uh, and eight milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. And so once those are all in there, all we need to do is get them onto the digester, uh, and turn it on. So it does have a temperature gauge, but this is the only analysis we use this for, and I have found that right there at the 5 is right where we want it to be, where it heats up quickly enough, but it doesn't boil too violently. Let's put that on. Plug it in. Uh, and then get these onto the digester. What I maybe have not mentioned is that it is morning right now. This digest is going to take minimum four hours, um, and you can go longer if you know if you're busy doing something. Uh, it doesn't hurt to go over the digest time, but you want to go at least four hours digest. And what we're going to be looking for is basically all of this liquid boiled away until all that's left is um, a little bit chunk of a mixture of the sulfuric acid and the copper sulfate that we put in, in the tablets. It will be a blue to green to teal, um, pretty vibrant color. Um, and also you're going to want to see white smoke coming up from the bottom. And if, when you see that, then uh, you can be pretty confident that the digest is complete. So for now, I will just leave this to have you watching four hours of 
real-time, unedited digestion. Just kidding. It's four hours later, uh, and these have now boiled on down. Um, I've got a big, thick glove for hand protection because those are very hot and full of sulfuric acid. But you can see the bluish greenish color on what is left over, and also I don't know if you can see the white smoke kind of coming up from there. So that's what you're looking for to say uh, when that's done. Uh, so now all we need to do is turn this off and then we can move these over to here to cool down. You're going to want to let them cool for I'm say 20 to 30 minutes before you do anything else with them. Uh, we're eventually going to add a little bit of water on top and if you add it in now it's just going to violently boil because what we have down here is just a super hot molten salt. Yeah, what's, what's left in here is the copper sulfate, the potassium sulfate that was from the Kelbalt tablets, and the sulfuric acid. So while those are cooling, I'm going to get the distillation unit ready. Um, so it needs to be plugged in. It's on camera. Down here. And then we need to turn the water on. That's just this green valve. Then we can flip the switch. It'll take a few seconds, uh, but you should see yeah, those numbers light up up top. And so it's a really pretty simple apparatus. Um, it's got the power switch on off, and then it only has three other buttons. The one on the left is labeled NaOH sodium hydroxide, so that's what you you would press if you wanted to just add in sodium hydroxide. The one in the middle has a little heat symbol, so that's what you would do if you just want to add the heating, uh, the six minutes of heating. And the one that you're, you're, you're going to be pressing the most is the one on the right, which has both of them, which is saying basically do a run, add in 50 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, and then heat it for six minutes. Um, but for now, just starting this up, I want to get it warmed up. And so I'm going to close the door and just hit the heat button. And so what that's going to do is start to pump steam in through this tube into our reaction vessel. Um, and then stuff that is evaporating is going to go up here and then distill down into our collection vessel. I'm just going to do this a couple of times with empty containers um, just to get the, the system all heated up. So while the distillation unit is warming up, I'm going to prep my collection vessels. I have eight of them set up and labeled, one for each of my reaction vessels. We got the blank spike and then one through six. Um, and all I need to do is put 50 milliliters of our trapping solution in. We usually keep it in here. It's The trapping solution is just 0.04 normal sulfuric acid. Um, and this bottle has a nice little recipe written on it. Uh, so if you need to make more, you just know add 1.1 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid for every liter of water that you add. And I think this bottle holds about three, three to four liters. Um, but so I already have that filled up in here and this is going to portion out 50 milliliters for each time that I use it. So all you have to do to use this and hold it to make sure that 
Um, it's not going to fall off. It is on pretty tight, so it, it probably won't fall off on its own, but I like to hold it around the neck to make sure that the two pieces um, stay together. Tilt it back to fill up this bulb with our solution. And then just pour it in. There you go, those are all filled up now. All right, so we are back in the hood. These have cooled off a little bit, so I'm just going to uh, put a little bit of deionized water on top of this, and that's just going to help the distillation. Um, it gives the sodium hydroxide some water to be dissolved in, and also I'm rinsing down the sides here to make sure anything that may have gotten uh, stuck on the sides during the digest gets rinsed down to the bottom. So I'm just doing like a circular motion to make sure I rinse down the sides. And at the bottom there's only, you know, maybe one or two centimeters worth of water. So it's really not much water you need. Uh, you just want a little layer. And of course I'm being careful not to touch the tip of this to the glass. I don't want to contaminate it, if possible. So now that those are there, um, I think we are just about ready to start our distillation. I'm going to start with the blank, and so I need to grab the collection vessel labeled blank, and then that's going to go right there. And then I need reaction vessel labeled blank. I'm going to be careful to only touch this with my mega gloved hand. Uh, and then that, I need to put it in so that the tube is inside the vessel. So there's this little uh, lever on the left side here that will move the stage for it. And so I pull this tube in, put it in, press the lever down, to sort of seat it. You want to make sure it's fairly um, snug up at the top where that rubber stopper is and then we can start our distillation so all that involves is bringing the blast shield down and then hitting the button on the far right and what you're going to see is it should be pumping some sodium hydroxide in and then that color behind there uh, turns from like that teal cyan to a darker blue um, and then once it's done pumping 50 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide in, it's going to start pumping that steam through the system to really heat it all up. So what we had in the bottom there was now a, basically a solid chunk of copper sulfate, sulfuric acid, uh, and then any of the, the nitrogen. And what this is going to do is it's going to re-dissolve that now and turn it into um, a solution again and then the steam is going to be piped up, bringing all of that ammonium with it, uh, and then it gets distilled inside here down into our collection vessel. Uh, I'm going to stop talking, but I'm going to let the tape keep rolling so you can see the, the process over time. My phone just gave me a low battery warning, so I think I'm going to cut it here and go charge up. Okay, phone's charged for a couple of minutes. Hopefully it's got enough juice to get through this take, uh, but I wanted to do this while it's fresh. That just finished, so I'm going to put my big fat glove on and get going. So what we're going to analyze is actually our what's in our collection vessel. Uh, and this is not hot at all, so you can uh, carry that with just a regular gloved hand. Um, I'm eventually going to fill that to volume, and then that's what we're going to analyze. Um, but what I've found with this analysis is that our distillation can be our rate limiting step, and so I want to get the next distillation on as soon as I can. Each time it takes about seven minutes, six minutes to run and then a minute in between. Um, but so 
with my gloved hand because this is extremely hot. I'm going to pull this off and just set it aside for now. Grab my next one, in this case it's my spike. Put that on. Again, press the lever down to lower the stage. And then make sure it's snugly on there. I need to grab my collection vessel for my spike. Close the glass shield and hit the button. So, while this is now going on, I'm going to be doing the other half of this, which is um, diluting the volumetric flask up to 250 milliliters, measuring out about 100 milliliters of that, uh, taking that into over to my ammonia meter and measuring it on there. Here we are at the ionized water station. Nothing fancy here. Just got to fill up to the line with our deionized water. And that's it. We are now ready to measure. So First thing I'm going to do is take some parafilm, uh, seal off the top of this volumetric flask, and invert it a couple of times to make sure it's fairly well mixed. Then I'm going to measure out 100 milliliters of it using this graduated cylinder. set that aside. I probably won't need that again. Put that into a 150 milliliter beaker. Set this aside. I'm going to have to rinse that before I use it again. Put my stir bar in. And this part should just be review from the previous video uh, on how to use the ammonia meter. I just need to rinse off the probe with the ionized water. Put this up here, turn the stir bar on, add in my ionic strength adjuster. And hit measure. So this was my blank. I'm expecting it to come in fairly low. Uh, I typically see part per million values uh, anywhere between 0 0.01 and we'll say 1. Um, if it's as high as 1 part per million, that could indicate a problem with your deionized water. Lately, we've been seeing it fairly low, and if, if it's be below 0 0.1, that's good, uh, because that's our low standard. But I'm going to give this time to equilibrate. I'm probably not going to do it on camera, because it, it does take some time. But that is basically it. I think I want to do one more shot that shows kind of the whole process, because it gets you get kind of into a rhythm of doing certain things. But that will be a little bit later because I need to charge my phone again. Okay, so what I want to show is one full kind of rotation of this process because we have two potential rate limiting steps and I want to get through them as quickly as possible. Uh, we can run up to 18 samples uh, at a time and these take minimum about seven minutes so you can do the math that's a little bit more than two hours of walking around and that's if you're fast at it. So I'm going to start, this is sample number one, it's just finished distilling, so I'm going to lift that up, take out the collection flask and just set it over here for now, get the number two collection flask in, and then i got to get the big glove on because the 
digest tube is very hot. Take that off and just set it over here. And then get digest tube number two onto the system. So minimize the amount of time that the distillation unit is not running. Bring that down, hit the button, and it should start going. Meanwhile, we still have this on. I'm going to take this old one over to our base waste. Unscrew our base waste. Dump this in. There will be a little bit of gunk left over, but that's fine. Uh, then I'm just going to rinse the rest down the drain. I usually do about three rinses of water, and then it goes to soak in our detergent bath. Alright, then we can head back over this way. Now my number one sample, it needs to be brought up to volume. That's just deionized water going in, bring it up to the line. Okay. And we're coming over here. I've got my parafilm. Stretch it over the top. Give it a few inversions to make sure it's mixed. Discard that parafilm. Measure out 100 milliliters of this. And I previously rinsed this uh, graduated cylinder, but one good thing you can do is rinse with what you're measuring with. So I'm actually gonna dump some of that out. And that's just if there's any residual water in there that would slightly dilute our sample. So now all that's residual in there is our sample. So I'm going to measure 100 milliliters. Okay. Set that aside. We're done with that for now. Actually, I'm going to do the same with our beaker because this has been rinsed now. So rinse that with our sample. That out. 100 milliliters into the beaker. That aside. Magnetic stir bar goes in. I'm going to rinse off my probe with deionized water. Set this off to the side. Add in my ionic strength adjuster. And then put my probe in and hit measure. And so now at this point, there are two things I'm watching. One of them is going to finish first, and it's not always the same one. There's the countdown timer on the distillation unit. Right now it's at four minutes. And then there is this. We need to wait for it to stabilize and read out the same thing twice in a row. But while those are going, I'm now going to rinse my glassware for the next run. So I'm going to take all of these over to the sink. Alright, our sample, we don't need any more. We can just dump that and then give it a rinse and set it to soak in our detergent. Our other beaker and our graduated cylinder, though, we're going to reuse. So, what I will do with those is give them a rinse with deionized water and then keep them for later. Probably about three rinses on the inside, and I'm also hitting that magnetic stir bar. And then do the same with the graduated cylinder.
Okay, and I'm gonna take these back and then turn them upside down so that some of the excess water can come out of it. Now that we're here, you can see that this has stopped, but again, we're not gonna take the reading until we get the same reading twice in a row, so I'm gonna hit the measure button again and watch it go down. Uh, and that sort of brings us back to the beginning. At this point, I'm just waiting to get a stable reading on that twice in a row, at which point I will write it down in my lab notebook and waiting for that countdown timer to reach zero and sample number two will be ready. So that's one rotation. So at this point, all of my analyses are done. After my last sample, I've run just uh, straight water in both of these vessels, both the reaction flask and the collection flask, um, through this dis distillation unit just to sort of clear out the system and make sure any residual uh, ammonia in there is, is washed out. When I did that, I only hit the middle button, which is just to send the steam through. I don't need sodium hydroxide for that last wash. Um, but so now for cleanup, I just sort of do the reverse of startup. We can leave these in here if you're going to use them again soon. If you're not going to run a distillation for a while, we can take these out and set to clean with the rest of them. Uh, it doesn't hurt to leave them in there. Otherwise, I'm just going to turn the apparatus off with this switch. I'm going to unplug it down here, and then also need to remember to turn my water off just so that I'm not wasting water. And then otherwise, over by the probe, um, the <laughs> Of all the wet chemical techniques that we do in this lab, this is probably the wettest, you know, in literal terms. There's a lot of water to clean up, um, and then a lot of discarded parafilm and paper towels and everything, so make sure you go over there, clean up all the trash, wipe it down, uh, and then we are done with the wet portion. All that's left is the data analysis, and then after that, we're going to run through just a quick explanation of what exactly is going on, you know, digest to distillation to analysis. So here we have uh, a template for our Keldahl analysis. Um, I already have my sample IDs in here, uh, and I've also already entered in my initial volumes. So for the most part, these are going to be 250. There are some times when we will be sent samples where we don't have 250 milliliters, and so it's, it's necessary to record the amount of liquid that you start with because this is taken into account when we do the calculations. Um, but usually we will just have 250 in this column. You'll also maybe notice that right here we have just a 50. I alluded to this before, but this is because for the spike, we're actually preparing it as if we were preparing a smaller volume of it and then diluting it down, and that's just because we um, our curve on the instrument only runs between 0 0.1 part per million and 10 parts per million, and if we were to prepare it in full, it would come in near 20 and so it would be outside of our curve and so we make a smaller batch to make sure that it shows up inside our curve. So all I have to do from here now is enter in my data. So for my blank I had 0 0.11 and you'll notice when I did that that changes this column, the blank subtracted column. This is basically just taking whatever I enter into this column and subtracting what I enter into that cell. So since these are a bunch of zeros right now, it's negative 0.11. For my next one, oh, I was looking at the wrong set of data. This should actually be a 0 0.28. Okay, next one is 5.0. And our, our instrument reads to two significant figures, so that's the 0 0.0 is uh, important there. If, uh, if you try and put in 5.0 and it doesn't let you, 
like it would be something like that, you're going to might want to make sure to increase the decimal places to show two significant figures. Okay, then 0 0.89. 0 0.59, 0 0.95, 0 0.30, 0 0.44, and 0 0.55. Okay, so that's all of our data. Now, this is our raw data that we've entered in. This is our blank subtracted because we want to make sure that we're not counting any nitrogen that is just in the system as as normal and so it's it's subtracting out the 0.28 and then uh, the report column is actually pretty interesting if you look up at the the formula bar here it, it's not as complicated as it looks the first part is just an if statement saying uh, if the calculation is going to end up being less than 0 0.1 which is our lower limit of of detection then just call it an ND and then if not run the calculation and and report out the number and so this one you know is, is, is going to be a zero uh, and so that would be uh, our ND uh, same with this one because we sub we subtracted out essentially as much as we measured that's going to be a non-detect as well uh, the others however they're going to take uh, this value which is our blank subtracted value and then divide it by uh, this value over 250 and so for most of the time it's just going to be that value right because if you're dividing by 250 250 divided by 250 is just one anything divided by one is itself and so you can see from here it's taking the 0.61 it's dividing it by 250 over 250 and giving us 0.61. So the only time that 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 calculation actually comes into play is if we have a volume here that is other than 250 as it is in our spike. That's basically it. We have the template all built already and so it's it's really just as easy as taking the raw data and putting it in this first column taking the volume data and putting it in here if, if necessary and then uh, reporting out the number in the report column. So we've done a lot of chemistry today uh, and I want to sort of make sense of it all um, and I think the key to this analysis, to understanding this analysis, is understanding the difference between ammonia and ammonium and following that throughout the process. So let's just do a quick compare and contrast ammonia versus ammonium. They are very similar in some ways and very different in others, and they are closely related, as you could probably guess by their names. So ammonia, that formula is NH3, ammonium is NH4 with a positive charge. Crucially, ammonia is a gas, and ammonium is an ion. And so what that means is they can both exist in solution, but in solution, the ion is stable. It's not going to go anywhere the gas is eventually going to um, diffuse out of it and escape into the atmosphere. And so what we have with these, these samples is uh, they want to know the total amount of nitrogen in the sample to start. Uh, and so they need to be able to trap that uh, in its state that when they collect it. And the way they do that is by keeping it as ammonium. Uh, and so these two related not just by how close their formulas are, but you can convert between them reversibly. And so if you want to, let's do it down here, if you have ammonia and you want to convert to ammonium, 
what you would need to do is put this into a an acidic environment. So add a hydrogen ion and you will get your ammonium and then conversely if you have ammonium and you put it in a basic environment that base is going to strip one of those protons off and give us ammonia and water. So that's maybe the more technical version of converting between ammonia and ammonium, but let me get a paper towel. I think it's easier to just uh, think of it that if you want ammonium, then you want to put this in an acidic environment. And if you want ammonia, then you want to put this in a basic environment. So instead of this explanation, we can just say we can convert between the two by changing the environment. So acidic environment versus basic environment. And so now, knowing this key part, we can trace the path of the sample from before we even get it. So the, the field operators are out there, they collect uh, some amount of water and they will immediately treat it with uh, sulfuric acid. And so by doing that, they introduce it to this acidic environment. So any ammonia floating around in that solution is going to be converted to ammonium and trapped. Um, additionally, so since this is a total nitrogen analysis, we're not just looking at ammonia and ammonium as they exist out in the world, but uh, more often we're seeing nitrogen from protein. Uh, we could be seeing nitrogen from nitrates, but that's what the first step in the lab is for. That's when we took it and put it in our digester. So if you remember, we put it through the digest, we added that copper sulfate and concentrated sulfuric acid. So not only does that uh, preserve the acidic environment for our ammonium, but it also just pulverizes any of those other forms of nitrogen and converts them to ammonium as well. So any protein that's in there, those long polymer chains of proteins, those are gonna get destroyed through the heat and the high acid. Um, and what we'll be left with is a bunch of ammonium uh, trapped in that little solid block at the bottom. Now, we can't analyze that solid block, so we need to get it out. So that's the point of the distillation. Um, when we put it into our distillation unit, let's, let's draw this out. We have our di distillation unit. We had the collection vessel over here and the digest flask over here. And then down here was our little block of copper sulfate and ammonium. And so the very first thing we did in here was we piped in some sodium hydroxide. Well, that does two things. One, it starts to dissolve that solid part. And two, it introduces it back into this basic environment. So we've now neutralized all of the sulfuric acid that's in there. We've reintroduced it into a basic environment, converted any of our ammonium into ammonia, uh, and then that's in there as a gas. Now thankfully this is sealed off with a rubber stopper so that ammonia can't escape out there. It's going to go up through the distillation tubes and so you can't see it over there but in there there's you know the distillation tube and that comes down there. It's cooling it in those coils and so the ammonia is going up through there getting cooled down condensing uh, with the water and dripping down into our collection flask. 
also crucial, if you remember in our collection flask, we had a uh, not very concentrated solution of sulfuric acid. And so we've now brought it back into an acidic environment, converted all of that ammonia back into ammonium, where we can hold it for a little bit. Then we took this flask, we brought it up to volume, and then we went to measure it. But if you recall, you know, in our beaker, we are not just measuring the 100 milliliters that came out of here. We are adding in that ionic strength adjuster. And that ionic strength adjuster contains sodium hydroxide, which is basic, which converts all of that ammonium that we had trapped in here back to ammonia. And so once it's in that state now, we've gotten rid of all the other stuff that we don't care about. We've uh, collected all of the nitrogen as ammonium. We've converted it to ammonia, and then that probe can read it. And so if you track from beginning to end, you know, we're, we're pushing this back and forth between acidic and basic environments over and over again, just to really control uh, how that nitrogen is existing and how we can bring it with us while leaving the stuff we don't care about behind. Anyway, thanks for sticking it out to the end. Thanks for watching. And uh, if you want to see the video on how to use the ammonia meter, you can click here-ish.